or choose to go in other directions. Gracious Lord, help us to not receive the false appearance, but to be pure of heart, to be true followers. For this we pray. Amen. Well, our scripture lesson today is the story of the triumphant entry. It begins, as it always does, year after year, with Jesus preparing to enter into Jerusalem, the Messiah, the King coming back to his home, his capital triumphant, having conquered sickness and ailments out in the country, having shown miracles and conquering over starvation, conquering over segregation and isolation. And now he comes to the city, the great city, to free her from sin and death. And Jesus comes not like the kings that we would expect. He doesn't come home to the great city riding on a brilliant white charger, sitting high above everyone else, triumphant in his armor and glory and with his pageantry of knights and soldiers behind him. He doesn't come riding in in the opulence of the carriage of France and the kings of, of, the, of the French regime. Instead, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt. A donkey. One of those you know, animals that doesn't traditionally have that kind of glory and mag magnificence. One of those animals that doesn't shout out, look at how great I am, look at how much I have. Instead, it is a common animal. The animal of, of the poor, of the drowned trodden, the, the animals that maybe a simple carpenter from Nazareth might have that might bear his wife to Bethlehem to bear her first child. It is on the back of a donkey that Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem as a triumphant but humble king, much like his ancestor David had done before him, coming home victorious from battle. And as Jesus is approaching the city, the crowds began to gather. Because it was the spectacle of the day. Here is this Messiah that has been the talk of the town for weeks, months, or even years. This guy who, who can heal the, the worst of illnesses. This guy who, who seems to eat with sinners and can silence the Pharisees. And, Anyone who can silence a preacher has got to be able to perform some kind of miracle. And here he is coming into town. And so they, they start streaming out, and all of the people that were, were on their way into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate the holidays, they start parting ways and they, they start saying, Oh, look, it's Jesus. And, and they start shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, loudest, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King and the Son of David. And it's this, this great parade that begins to happen. And they, they start throwing their coats down in the road. It's like, it's like the red carpet before red carpets existed. And they start breaking down the palm branches from all of the trees. And, and they're waving them in the air, the palm branches of victory. And it's this huge ordeal. And for a moment, everything looks as if it's going to go Jesus' way. I mean, it looks like the crowds understand who he is. It looks like Israel sees their Messiah coming home. It looks like the time has come. This time that Israel has been waiting for for over 400 years.
Even Jesus seems to be smiling, seems to be celebrating, even though he knows what's going to happen. And we know he knows because in one of the other Gospels we, we get a glimpse that, that he doesn't hold that smile forever, that there's a moment where he laments over the people. Over the fact that they are singing his praises now, but, but by Friday, their shouts of Hosanna, loudest Hosanna, will turn to crucify him. <clears throat> Appearances are deceived. By all appearances, this is a day of great celebration. This is the day of triumph of, of God and Jesus being recognized. By all appearances, even the Pharisees understand and see and acknowledge Jesus' power because the Pharisees come to him and say, silence these crowds. It takes power to silence a crowd hailing a parade. Think about how many people you know that could sit there and suddenly say something from on a float or on a donkey's back that the entire parade would just stop and everyone would go home. Not very many people can do that. But the Pharisees know that Jesus has power. They know that he's a threat. They may even know that he's the Messiah, but the problem is, is that he's not the Messiah that they want. Because Jesus isn't going to continue allowing them to do things as they've always done. He isn't going to continue to allow them to hold power. And the funny thing is, is that even 2,000 years removed, the crowds and the church still have appearances that are deceiving. I'm sure we all know people who, who go to church and, and who love to, to display and say how holy they are. And when they're out in the public eye that everything is about, look at me and how great and wonderful I am and how faithful I am. But when they're at home, when they're in the privacy of their close friends and family, they clearly are not following Jesus. And their actions, and their heart, and their desires, and their reasons for doing what they do, clearly are not in line with God. We also know those people who, who probably start coming to to various churches or organizations, not because they believe in the mission of the organization or what it does, but because they are seeking a way to find power. That they, they want to be on the boards and they want to control everything and they want to tell other people what to do. And it doesn't matter what the actual organization was meant to do. They take it over and bend it to their will. You have the crowds and you have the Pharisees. And then I think there's the disciples among us. Those of us who, who probably have tried to follow Jesus, who've tried to understand Jesus, who are, who are there shouting our praises and our loud hosannas, but who, if we're honest, really have no idea what's coming. We don't expect Good Friday. We are there celebrating and we're ready for, for Palm Sunday and we're, we're ready for the triumphant entry and we, we imagine that it's going to be easy because we've seen how he was received out in the towns and the villages. We've seen how he was received in the past and how easy it was to get people to come and follow him in the past. But now in the present, we struggle. Because it seems like God is, is going 
in a different direction. One that we weren't quite prepared to shift to. That maybe God is calling us to something a little more difficult than what we prepared for. That it's not just about sitting around and, and hearing his lessons day in and day out. And it's not about sitting there and just and just kind of taking care of a few people here and there and so on and so forth. But that Jesus is calling for us to, to have lives that are completely transformed. And, and oftentimes that those lives transformed are difficult. They involve us making sacrifices. Of, of actually giving things up to make other people's lives better. Of choosing to let go to the things that we've held on to. You see, Jesus, Jesus knows our hearts. And while He loves the celebration while he enjoys that moment with the crowds. He also knows that his closest disciple, Peter, will within a week deny him three times. He knows that one of his other disciples is going to betray him. He knows that they will be scattered. That they will be broken apart. That they will be downtrodden. That they will think that he is dead. And that this whole thing is lost. That they will be hopeless. And distraught. Because they still don't get who he is. And what he's doing. We are called to be his disciples. We are called to be a people that, that do not deceive with our appearance by pretending that we have it all together or by lording our faith over others. We are not called to, to be power hungry. But instead we are called to faithfully follow to go where Jesus leads us and to prepare the way for him to enter into other people's lives. We are called to a life of sacrifice on behalf of our King. A life that, that shouts loudest Hosanna from deep within our hearts, but a life that is also open and willing to admit that we don't always know what's going on. We don't always know where we're going, how we're going to get there, or what exactly this Savior, this teacher, this, this King of ours is actually planning on doing. And when we can be open and honest, and when we can admit that we don't have the answers and we can just trust that Jesus is leading us in the right direction and when we can trust even when things become difficult, even when Good Friday starts to loom in front of us, when we can trust that even when it looks like the world has won, that Easter is coming, then we will live life differently. We will live Life, as Jesus calls us to. And we will be transformed by his love and his power. This week, Holy Week, we remember what Jesus did. We remember his presence with us in the Last Supper, his promise to be with us always. We remember that he died for us. But most importantly, we remember that he will live and that he does live and that he will continue to reign on forever and ever 
as the resurrected Messiah, as the King and the Lord of Lords, as the star of Easter celebration. And when we remember these things, we will live them out ourselves. Amen.